You can sometimes forego human rights. Human rights aren't always at the heart of the things we do. So much so that in the fight against terrorism, we might need to rip up some of our human rights laws. Those are the words not of me. <laughs> I work to advance human rights. Those are the words of the Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May, in June 2017. I start with her because in 1948, the United Kingdom, representing not only itself, but I suppose the rest of its realms, the colonial realms, one of those countries is where I'm from, came to negotiate a universal declaration for human rights at the time one would argue that the United Kingdom was speaking for itself as well as for its colonial entities. I'd beg to differ, I wasn't there, I'm not 70 years old. In 2017, Theresa May, in 2018, Theresa May seems to think that once you've had your go at human rights, you can tear them up, not for British people, but for the people you are pursuing, because justice becomes an individual act. Human rights becomes individualized. For me, that's a problem. If the notion of universal declaration of human rights is about ensuring that every single person, not just me, not just Theresa May, not just the people in power, the downtrodden, the people who work every single day to ensure that they can be able to fulfill their lives peacefully, securely, happily, that all those people, seven point something billion, enjoy universal human rights. They can't be a prime minister that says, we can throw away human rights for certain people. But Theresa May is not on her own. Theresa May stands with a number of people sweeping across Europe, Asia, the Americas, Africa, who feel that their human rights are above everyone else's. And those human rights need to be upheld against everyone else. Whether it's people who are trying to flee parts of the African continent because of conflict or misgovernance or corruption, finding themselves losing their lives across the Mediterranean and those who eventually do make it across, being welcomed sometimes by happy faces, sometimes by Gert Wilders. People who feel that in order for them to be able to enjoy their human rights, someone else must suffer. Because it's not about human rights when we speak about populist rhetoric, it's about my life, my dignity, my ability to succeed, my socioeconomic well-being, and for me to be able to have life, dignity, freedom of religion, whatever you want to call it, someone else must not. Is that universal? I don't think so. I say this coming from the African continent where a number of things that one would say, one would presume, Many communities lack the ability to be able to exercise fully their human rights. But they're fundamental, aren't they? They're universal, aren't they? We've got a document that tells us that all men and women are free. So how is it that there are people in communities who don't know or who don't feel that their dignity is understood, that their dignity is respected, that they have dignity at all? I'm here today to say, yes, we've got a universal declaration of human rights. Yes, we've got a document that reinforces all those things that are supposed to be fundamental. Not just to me, not just to Theresa May, not just to Donald Trump. I'll name them all if I have to. To everyone in this room and everyone outside of this room, the people that are listening in online, ought to feel that they also enjoy fundamental human rights just as much. And yet we live in a world where in order for us to be able to assert our human rights, human rights as things that you assert, not things that are presumed of you because you are human. 
if we are to bring back humanity into the notion of human rights, whether it is about my freedom to tweet, whether it is about my ability to leave my house at 9 p.m. at night or at midnight feeling fully safe, because there can be no man who sees me and thinks her rights today don't deserve to be observed. Fundamentally, that's the world we're working towards. I'm not 70 years old. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is. I'm in my 30s. I want to make sure that my children, the children that they have, can be able to stand here and fully feel that they're in the Peace Palace that they don't feel that peace is only felt in certain halls, but that peace is understood and felt elsewhere, anywhere that they may be. And I think that's an important point of departure when we speak about human rights, because fundamentally, we shouldn't have to be talking about human rights. We talk about them because other people tell us. Unfortunately, in some instances, whether it's the fight against terrorism, whether it's to keep the Africans out of the European continent, keep the Mexicans back in their homes. It's about saying, my rights are affected by your existence. Those are not human rights. That is a way in which people use their ability to communicate their needs against the needs of other people. I'm here today not just representing myself or the Institute for Security Studies where I work or the African continent where I come from. I'm here to say, quite strongly I hope, that if universal, let me rephrase, if human rights are to be universal, they cannot be individualized to the point where you use them against another person. It cannot be that in order for you to be richer, better, happier, someone else must be poorer, sadder. It cannot be. Not in 2018, not in 2017 when Theresa May felt it was okay that the human rights of people not yet accused ought to be violated in order to hypothetically prevent them from hypothetically committing a crime. Bearing in mind how important and fundamental it is for a person to be presumed innocent, it's something that I don't need to say here in The Hague. Bearing in mind all of that, it cannot be that a prime minister of a nation that sought to ensure that human rights are universal could ever say that. And yet it is. And she's not alone. Thank you.